All right, Mr. Mayor, you're good to go. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the October 17th uh, City Council meeting for the City of Burlingame. We're calling the meeting to order at, I believe we're a little bit behind, at 7.02. And with that, we will just move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. And I've asked our Community Development Director, Mr. Kevin Gardner, to uh, lead us, please. Thank you, everyone. Please stand if you can. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. And with that, we will move on to roll call. So, Madam City Clerk, if you would. Councilmember O'Brien. Present. Councilmember Beach. Here. Councilmember Colson. Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Yes, here. Uh, Mayor Ortiz. Yes, I am here. And with that, we'll move on to our uh, report from our closed session. I'll pass it on to our city attorney, Mr. Michael Dina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there is no reportable action um, from tonight's closed session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we'll move on to our upcoming events. I do have a few that I received from our Parks and Rec, and so I will read this one. Do you have questions about CalFresh, nutrition assistance, and or Medi-Cal health coverage? Do you need assistance with the application process? On Thursday, November 3rd, from 8 to 1, stop by the community center to speak with staff from the County of San Mateo Human Services Agency. Staff will provide individual consultations for CalFresh applicants and can even issue an EBT card on site. Also, Zumba instructor Corey Mikoshiba is offering a free Halloween family Zumba class on Sunday, October 23rd at 4 p.m. at the community center. The event combines fun and fitness and is a full of upbeat music, including Halloween songs, of course, and easy to follow routines. Costumes are encouraged. Uh, with that, we also have a town hall celebrating Congresswoman Jackie Spears' uh, uh, work that she's done on our behalf and that'll be uh, uh thursday october 27th from six to seven at the sequoia room um i don't know if we have our city librarian if he has any uh, announcements from the library he's not on yet He'll very on good later. so with that i'll pass it colleagues anybody have any uh upcoming events they would like to share and with that then we move on to presentations so Item number 6A is a presentation of certificates recognizing the 2022 I Voted Sticker Contest winner. Uh, first of all, thank you, Megan, for all your hard work on this. It, it, this has been just a lot of fun to follow it and uh, to see the, fin the finalists. So with that, all yours. Well, I'm gonna promote, I see two of our winners are in the audience. I'm gonna promote them. I have Charlotte and Lauren. Uh, yes, yeah, so we did our first ever I Voted Sticker Contest. Uh, we had 175 entries into our first contest, and I really need to thank uh, Parks and Rec Department for all their assistance in getting this project going. Uh, there was a lot of sweating while we figured out who was the winner because it was just probably the hardest thing I've had to do in my job so far, pick a couple designs that won. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to show you our winning sticker. So these, we had them printed. They're going to be available at both of our voting centers, at the community center. And I know that I believe Lauren, who's on as one of our winners, will be handing out the sticker, which makes it even cooler. Um, and they'll be available at City Hall or the library if you vote by mail and still want a sticker. We also... Um, printed them into posters so that uh, you can see them displayed at City Hall in the library. So without further ado, and I believe, the, oops, let me show the first one. So the first sticker was our youngest winner, which was Owen for the age group one to eight. And we thought this was great, a little boom, I voted. It shows you just how excited you should to be to vote. And our second winner who is on with us tonight is Charlotte. 
and she uh, very accurately depicted the fact that we all love trees here in Burlingame <laughs> and we loved the bright colors and the fact that it actually said Burlingame. Our third winner who's on with us and who will be working oh, at um, a voting center is Lauren and hers is Yep, I Voted. This one I think is gonna be a hot ticket at the voting centers. And our overall winner, the one uh, that we picked as the overall winner this year oh. is Jessica who hand drew this, which is pretty amazing. And so this is definitely gonna be a tradition that we continue on in the city in future elections as it was just too much fun to see how creative our students are here in Burlingame. So uh, in honor of that, I do have certificates, which I of course forgot to take pictures of to show the girls what they'll be getting, but they will also be getting a generation voter hoodie that says, uh, make your voice matter on the back. And it's pretty awesome. That's great. So thank you. So we have Lauren and Charlotte here. Charlotte, would you like to say a couple words about how much fun you had? <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little shy that's fine this was unprepared how about you lauren are you excited to work at the voting center on election day uh yes i'm very excited to participate in that and also hand out the stickers which will be really fun because i always liked getting those stickers when i was going with my parents to the voting polls so it'll be nice to be able to be involved in that that's Great. awesome. Thank you. So congratulations to our four winners. And we can't wait to see everyone in town wearing these stickers. So Charlotte and Lauren, I don't, I don't know where Charlotte went, but uh, Lauren, <laughs> Charlotte, thank congratulations. And uh, thank you for submitting to everybody who submitted the uh, artwork. We really appreciate you participating. And I thank you all the winners and look forward to being there. Now, I'm going to take this opportunity to remind everybody that you should have your ballots in the mail. You should have received them by now. And if you haven't, you can reach out to the uh, elections office to find out uh, what the problem is or how to get a, a uh, duplicate. Uh, is that correct, Megan? Or I said exactly it right. right. You got Very it. Very good. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. That was exciting. I look forward to meeting you guys in person. So with that, we will move on to our beautification awards. And I have uh, Richard Kirshner with our, the chair of our beautification committee uh, who is going to do the presentation. Mr. Kirshner. Yeah, and um, Megan, can you also let in um, Commissioner Bate? She's also in there, it's Carol Bate. Yes, one second. All right. And then I'm gonna share my screen for Chair Kirchner. Nope, is he in yet? There he is. All right, Chair Kirchner, I'm gonna share my screen. And then I'm just, do you want me to just um, slide through as we go, as you're talking? No, oh, that would be great. Um... So before we start this, though, and uh, thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Mayor and the City Council, I'd just like to take a, uh, a moment because the Commission has asked uh, if we couldn't acknowledge the contributions made by one of our former commissioners who passed away August 12th of this year at age 93, as particularly pertain, this would be Dale Perkins. And as particularly pertains to the Beautification Committee, he was a member of the newly formed Beautification Commission in the mid early, late 80s, mid 70s, and contributed to the effort to um, recognize and designate the Easton Drive and Julius Frankhard Eucalyptus Groves as heritage groves. But they didn't stop there. Uh, in 2008, he started to watercolor renderings for each of the Business Landscape Award winners. 13 of them, in fact, up until last year. And in the words of Leslie McQuaid, another Burlingame commissioner, Dale was a treasure to the community. Not only had he beautifully captured the essence of our landscape award winners with his watercolors, but he did also do all that gratis as a gift to the city. I knew him personally. He was a true gentleman. He will be sorely missed and his smile and personality were as bright as his paintings. 
with that, that's a good way to move on to the Burlingame Beautification Commission Business Landscape Award. This award recognizes the efforts of businesses to beautify the city of Burlingame and to encourage attractive landscaping improvements in our community. 2022 Burlingame Beautification Commission Business Landscape Award recipient this year is Green Banker Realty at 398 Primrose Road, Mr. Stanley Lowe, owner. We'll go through the slides here, just so you know, this award, um, recognizes a beautifully maintained landscape about an equally well-maintained circa 70s, early 80s commercial building. What's really commendable is the variety and placement of plantings uh, about the building and next to the entrance. Green thumb envy abounds here. Italian cypress, mm -hmm. manicured box hedges, star jasmine, maples, all in a 12 foot by 75 foot landscape frontage. Uh, they have uh, that advantage over those other businesses who are on the sidewalk. Um, I would like to point out, though, for those businesses, we had two awards in the past that uh, exemplify what can be done. In 2011, Il Fernile, 327 Lorton Avenue, and in 2023, Stacks Restaurant, 361 California Drive. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at, I think, uh, those kinds of enhancements to our community in the future. So with that, do you think you've seen the, seen the, uh, the business award? Shall we move on to the um, 2022 Residential Sustainable Landscape Award? This award recognizes exceptional residential landscape design that exemplifies, exemplifies both drought tolerant landscapes and incorporate strategies for reducing potable water use. This is our fifth award. I'd like to point out that the other four awards previous, each one is so unique. There should be, a, well, there will be a list with the Burlingame Parks and Rec Department of where these are, because if you are looking to do that kind of a landscape, uh, this, the variety and diversity of these landscapes are truly wonderful. This landscape award goes to Justin Ching and Vivian Lee, 1600 Ray Park in uh, Ray Drive, excuse me, in Ray, Ray Park. It's on the corner of Balboa and Ray Drive. Um, children walking to school probably walk by it every day and don't realize they're walking by a truly oh, no, beautiful. beautiful landscape. It's been on our radar screens for several years, and it's a testament to uh, well-maintained and actually enhanced landscape. This didn't happen overnight and it just keeps getting better. Color, texture through the selection of unique and diverse plant materials and permeable ground cover is well-placed and all of it is sustainable through a well-managed uh, irrigation system. Uh, as you saw from the pictures, they also use negative space which is uh, sort, of, sort of unique. What, is, what I'm saying is that there's, there's blank spots, well-placed. It's a, it's a absolute wonderful little, uh, not so little, but a wonderful landscape. Well, that, uh, that concludes our, my presentation. I appreciate this opportunity and I look forward to doing it again next year. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Kirshner. I always look forward to this and uh, it, it does change the uh, the presentation without Mr. Perkins' uh, uh, watercolors, so I appreciate you taking the time to recognize him. Uh, he really was an important part of this community, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, also, I, I walk by that house all the time, and uh, I have looked to copy that whole yard, so that's great that they got it. It's a, it is spectacular, so thank you very much. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you to the congratulations to the winners. You're welcome. With that, we will move on now to our- Mr. Uh, Mayor, you have a hand up, Council Member Colson. Oh, I'm so sorry. Council Member Colson, please. So, so two quick questions, and I'm not volunteering myself because my art talents are not yet uh, refined enough, but might there be another, um, you know, maybe we should try to, put out a call for artists in the community that might like to take up the mantle that, that Dale Perkins had. And, you know, we can explain what it is, but, you know, just like we do, look at the amazing art we got from our young artists on our, on our pins, you know, so this could be young people, artists, old, anyone, but could rotate artists, but maybe, you know, we, 
have an opportunity here to um, reinvigorate the um, the uh, solicitation of future Burlingame artists and see if we could find some that might do some um, lovely sketches or paintings or things and and path, continue that tradition. That's number one. And number two, um, you know, when I was sitting in the meetings a few years ago in the beautification meetings, a couple of them, um, there were a few, we had a number of renters that were on our beautification committee and they were wondering constantly if we were ever going to pick a multifamily residential building in our portfolio of recognized um, landscapes. We always seem to focus on single family homes. And I'm almost wondering if maybe we should actually add that category on or um, definitely figure out a way to flip it like every other year, like one year we do single family homes, the next year we do multifamily. We have so many beautiful, small multifamily residential apartment buildings and the tenants often care for the yards and they're very proud of them. It could be a balcony with somebody who just has beautiful plantings on a balcony. I just feel like we're excluding 50 some odd percent of our community that's got some cool landscaping and maybe we should be a little open-minded to expanding the mandate one way or another. Thank you. I think that's a great thought. I think both of those are great ideas. So uh, uh, Vice Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank the Beautification Commission for rewarding uh, property owners for, for making the extra effort. Uh, you know, what we all do, what we garden in our backyard is really for us and our families. But what you put in the front yard is for the community and the neighbors who are walking by. And it's it's just such a pleasure that um, that the Lee family has contributed to the community, that Mr. Lowe has contributed with his. So I want to thank the individuals and also thank the commission for, for calling this out. Um, it's what makes our city so pretty. Thank you. Now no, I'm embarrassed with my dead lawn in front. I got to go do something about it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, anybody else have any comments? And with that, again, Mr. Kirshner, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate all your service. And, and uh, this is a wonderful tradition. I think we can, I hope we continue it. And I love uh, Council Member Colson's idea of finding a, uh, somebody to take Mr. Perkins' mantle. So thank you for that. All right. Good night. And then we, we I, I believe it'll be an agenda item fairly soon. So, and I want to thank uh, Council Member Colson as well. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. With that, guys, we will move on to item number seven, which is public comment for items that are not on the agenda. So I'll remind the speakers that these are not for items that are later on on the agenda. And with that, I'll pass it to our city clerk. Ooh, I see one hand up. So Mary Beth. Hi, my name is Mary Beth Bykowski. I'm an outreach analyst at the California Department of Insurance, also known as CDI. I want to share with you what we have been doing on behalf of your constituents. Since 2019, we've met with more than 25,000 people in 40 counties and held 60 events to specifically hear concerns around both the availability and the affordability of homeowners insurance. In January of 2022, the Insurance Commissioner, Ricardo Lara, and the state's emergency response and readiness agencies, they created the Safer from Wildfires framework. So what we just did is we met with the other state agencies, so we all have a consistent approach on how we're advising to harden your home. So this ground-up approach for wildfire resilience has three layers of protection. At CDI, we call it the one, two, three plan, protect the structure. Number two, protect the immediate surroundings. And number three, involve your entire community. We believe this is the most important layer to prevent wildfires from catching and spreading to other homes and businesses in the neighborhood. I've been to a number of events in San Mateo County and I know your local fire agencies keep you well informed of the actions to take to do this. So you can see our entire list of specific actions on our website, insurance.ca.gov, but I'm not gonna go into the specifics here. So by making homes and businesses safer, we can bring the risk down, which will bring the cost down as well. The commissioner's actions are focused on safety and transparency and his new regulations do this in three ways. He is requiring the insurance companies to incorporate the framework into their pricing Insurance companies will have to submit new rate filings that recognize safety. 
consumers will receive their property's wildfire risk score and the reasons for it. In the past, this information was considered proprietary and CDI will have oversight and consumers will be able to appeal their risk determination when they have done the work. Public input was critical to ensure we were on the right track. We held a hearing on April 13th that accepted public comments. We evaluated all the input from the public and submitted the new regulations to the Office of Administrative Law. And good news, just today, we heard that the regulations were accepted. So are now it is state law and insurance companies have 180 days to submit their new rates. Just to remind you, we are California's largest consumer protection agency. Everything we do at CDI is to protect consumers from fraud and abuse. And we also provide a number of free informative presentations and informational guides for homeowners, drivers, and our senior community. This concludes my presentation. I just want to remind you that your constituents can call us with any problems or insurance questions. Our hotline is 800-927-4357, and it's manned by experts. And if directed to leave a message, we have a two minute callback average. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bykowski. Do we have any other speakers? I don't have any hands raised and I don't have any emails, so you're good to go. Thank you, very good. With that, we will move on to item number eight, which is approval of the consent calendar. So first colleagues, anybody have any items they'd like to pull? I see the Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Item 8C, Mr. Mayor, please, thank you. Item 8C, thank you. Anybody else? And with that, we will move to uh, members of the public. Any member of the public wishing to pull any of the items? I don't have any emails to pull an item and I don't see any hands up. Thank you very much. And back to colleagues, if I could have a motion to approve items 8A, B, D, and E. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. Thank you. A motion by Council Member Beach and second by Council Member Colson. Uh, let's have a roll call, please. Council Member O'Brien. Yes. Council Member Beach. Yes. Council Member Colson. Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Yes. Mayor Ortiz. Yes. And with that, we'll move on to item number 8C. Uh, and do we want to do the presentation, Mr. Vice Mayor, or do you? No, I think I can um, jump into my questions and, and comments. Um, I do have a quick prefatory question, which is, can you, can someone remind me, is our, is Burlingame's minimum wage as, uh, still ahead of the state minimum wage? It is, right? Council? It is. It is. Yeah. yeah. So I have a mechanical question and then I have a comment. My mechanical question is in the contract, and let me back up for a second. So in my day job, I spend a lot of time looking all around the country at different service industries. And uh, there are a lot of great essential service providers out there. This particular sector, janitorial services, is notorious, not in California or in Burlingame, but across the country, for taking advantage of workers who are not really able to stand up for themselves. And there are a lot of different ways and I won't bore people with how it happens, but it is a sector that tends to attract uh, folks who don't have a lot of power, sometimes don't speak um, English all that well and get taken advantage of. So it's important to me as a steward of Burlingame to try to make sure we don't participate unintentionally in those kind of um, in that supporting those kind of businesses. And I don't think this one is, so I wanna be clear about that. But one of the, one of the ways that um, people get taken advantage of is when they are not full-time employees, when they're all independent contractors. And I, again, I won't bore people with how it happens, but I do think there's a pretty strong correlation between com janitorial companies that use all outside contractors, basically gig workers, and those who have FTEs. So my, First question is, do, do we ask the janitorial companies to tell us how many of their employees are FTE? Do we ask if they provide health benefits? And if not, then I would suggest in future, I, I think we should. So let me start with the question. Do we ask whether employees are FTE or 1099? So I got good evening, um, Council Member Brown, Rick. Um, and and I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Maury, let me, I do get passionate about this because across the country, I, 
I see people exploited, but this is not about Burlingame. I don't think we're doing anything wrong. So I hope you don't take my question as criticism. It's not meant that way. Yeah, no, not, not at all. Um, let me just give you a, a little background and might answer your questions on this contract. So uh, this company does hire, you know, the, um, the, the janitors as, as their staff. Uh, there is a requirement um, in the in the in the code, the um, you know the the public code that uh, it's called the Displaced Janitor Opportunity Act. So um, it requires that a uh, new janitorial service contract uh, it requires that contractor to offer um, positions to the the existing contractors that are that are currently contracted with the existing provider. And they're given um, that that opportunity to accept decline, but they're given like a sixty day, you know, period of evaluation. So they're they're allowed to continue on. And then, um, additionally, our contract requires prevailing wage. So prevailing wage um, uh, is a requirement, um, you know, for this for this staff. It has the base pay rate, but it also includes benefits. And in and in this case, the lowest the lowest rate. Uh, does include um, you know ten dollars of benefits that's that's uh, required as well, which includes health benefits, vacation, pension benefits. So there are certain contractual requirements that um, I believe uh, so may I, address your concerns. It absolutely does, and I appreciate that. I didn't see that in the service contract. I realize now, in hindsight, it's there indirectly by saying we adopt all local laws and state laws. How do we check that? How do we check that uh, the, the the employees are getting the benefits that we've told the contractor they're supposed to provide? So the um, the contractor is is required to be um, uh, um, a member or log in through the DIR, which is the state uh, you know department that kind of monitors this. They need to upload their prevailing wage uh, monthly, I believe, and it's. Um, it's there for us to access at any time and check, or if we do receive a complaint from an employee, we can easily follow that, that, that up by checking the state website. And, and I guess I'll, I'll probably quit here, but I would say that um, th typically across the country, this is not a class of workers that you can anticipate will make complaints. They don't feel typically that they're in a position where they can complain. So I think to the extent that we want people to be paid what we think they're getting paid, we should institute a, a periodic random check, however we do that. And I don't think we should be embarrassed about it. Um, and that's, I think, that way we can all sleep at night knowing that people are being paid what they're supposed to be paid and getting the benefits that they're supposed to be getting. And I want to thank you and thank my colleagues for allowing me to, to probe on this, on this question. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and we can easily um, we can easily check uh, through the state website, and so we'll uh, you know we'll institute that a uh, little more often. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Morimoto. Thank you for that, uh, colleagues. Any other questions of Mr. Morimoto? Uh, having none, then we can open it for members of the public. Any questions from the public on this item? I don't have any emails, and I don't see any hands up. Very good. I'll bring it back to the colleagues for comments or to I entertain a motion to approve item number 8C. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I will make a motion to approve item 8C. I do hope staff will think through this conversation and both in terms of monitoring this out, this contract and maybe thinking about the way we bid uh, the next contract for janitorial services that will we'll think about the reality on the ground for this industry. So I, I appreciate it. I make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Brownrigg and a second by Council Member O'Brien. If we could have a roll call, please. Council Member O'Brien? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Here, yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. Mayor Ortiz? Yes. Thank you. And then with that, we will move on to item number. Actually, we're going to combine items number 9A and B. Uh, and I will hand it over to our community development director, Mr. Kevin Gardner, to present this one. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Ortiz. And um, if the city clerk could please let in um, to the panel, Chief Building Official Rick Caro and Fire Marshal Christine Reed, if there are questions for those individuals. Uh, this is our triannual update of the fire and building codes found in Title 17 and 18 of the Burlingame Municipal Code, respectively. Uh, state codes are updated every three years, and local jurisdictions may adopt local amendments to reflect their local conditions, procedures, and practices. Uh, for the record, the findings describing those local conditions are included in both ordinances. There is overlap between the fire and building codes, so the Central County Fire Department has worked cooperatively with the City of Burlingame Building Division to ensure consistency throughout the entire process and amended codes. Uh, the staff reports provide an overview of some of the notable changes to the fire and building codes. I'm going to do a real quick screen share here. This is in the staff report as well, but um, for the fire code, these include uh, manual control of the mechanical ventilation systems in parking garages, uh, a requirement that fire alarm services be installed by a UL listed fire alarm company, uh, that a fire control room be included in all new buildings and um, buildings with significant renovations, and additional fire sprinkler density over EV charging stations. Uh, for the building code, uh, similar fire sprinkler requirements for EV charging stations that are also in the fire code, uh, and the same requirement that alarm systems be installed by a UL listed fire alarm company. Uh, and also, although not highlighted in the summary, there have been amendments to the flood damage protection chapter 18.22 to be compliant with FEMA. Uh, much of this focuses on definitions and FEMA staff have reviewed the chapter and provided direction that's shown in the amendments. So, as mentioned, this has been a collaborative effort between building fire uh, and with public works. And with us this evening is Chief Building Official Rick Caro, Fire Marshal Christine Reed, uh, also recognized Fire Inspector Julie Parenti, who um, was uh, very key to this effort. And then uh, Assistant Director of Public Works, Art Morimoto, is also available. So uh, all of us are available for any questions of staff. Great, thank you. And thank you, uh, Ms. Reed and Mr. Carr for being here tonight. Uh, colleagues, any questions of staff? Uh, Council Member O'Brien. Yeah, so I had one quick question. Um, page seven. Uh, after hours inspections will be billed at a rate of a minimum of three hours. I was just curious, how long do inspections usually take? Uh, thank you for the question. It really depends on the kind of inspection that uh, has been requested. We do anything from um, special event permit inspections to construction inspections that we need to do um, at night when we need to look at things in the dark, um, like exit lighting and things like that. Um, so it really kind of depends. Um, after hours, it, it is done on an overtime basis. Um, so we can see anywhere from one hour hour to three hours ish, depending on the kind of inspection. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Yeah. My other question, um, Kevin, is probably more for you on page 19. Um, when a building permit is required, it's under 17.04.093. And it talks about um, structures being retroactively protected and then it goes into uh, when that kicks in. So it says for a building permit is required, will exceed 1200 square feet in area that's added on. Does that include ADUs or not? Um, if I could uh, defer to Chief Building Inspector uh, Caro, if uh, Rick, if you're able to Can, can you repeat that, um, Council Member O'Brien? So it's on page um, 19 under section 17.04.093. I actually don't have that. Um, oh, okay. So it, it's under um, CFC existing buildings and structures. All existing buildings and structures shall be retroactively protected by an approved automatic extinguishing system when the following conditions exist. 
commercial and multifamily residential buildings with a total building floor area in excess of 2,000 square feet or more than two stories in height. And when additions or alterations for which a building permit is required will exceed 1,200 square feet in area. So does that include ADUs? If you're adding on, let's say, to a home and then you're adding an ADU or you're adding an ADU to a multi-dwelling project. Does that get counted into the square footage? Or is that exempt? Go ahead, Christine. Sorry, I didn't want to step on Rick. No, um, no. No. <laughs> Um, no, so this section is related to, like you read, um, for alterations and additions. When okay. it comes to ADUs, it depends on if they're detached or attached. If it is a detached ADU, then we do not count it um, if it is further than 10 feet away. So and there's another section that we're going to combine the square footage of, of buildings if they're less than 10 feet apart from each other. Okay. So if you have an, a detached ADU, we don't count it. Um, if it is an attached ADU, say they're adding to their house, mm -hmm. then we are able to add that addition of an ADU with any other renovations that might be happening in the dwelling unit um, to accommodate the ADU, and then those would fall under the 1,200 square feet. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Sure. Thanks, Christine. Okay, colleagues, any other questions? And having none, then uh, we will go ahead and ask the city clerk to read the title of the proposed ordinances. Let's start with uh, number 9A first. An ordinance of the city of Burlingame amending Title 17 of the Burlingame Municipal Code and adopting by reference the 2022 California Fire Code, Title 24, Part 9, CFC, and the 2021 edition of the International Fire Code. Very good. Colleagues, I'll entertain a motion to waive further reading. Motion to waive further reading, Mr. Mayor, and adopt the, or introduce. adopt, introduce, thank you, sorry, wrong verb, introduce the resolution, thank you. Ordinance. Ordinance. <laughs> second. Okay, so we have a motion by uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg and a second by Council Member O'Brien. Could we have roll call, please? Council Member O'Brien? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. Mayor Ortiz? Yes. And we will move on to item number 9B. Could you please uh, read the title of thy ordinance? An ordinance of the City of Burlingame amending Title 18 of the Burlingame Municipal Code, adopting by reference the 2022 editions of the California Building Standards Code, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, CCR T24, State Housing Law, the California Code of Regulations, Title 25, Division 1, Chapter 1, Subchapter 1, Section 32, CCR T 25, 2021 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code, 1997 <clears throat> Uniform Administrative Code, 1997 Uniform Housing Code, 1997 Uniform Code for the Abatement of Dangerous Buildings and Amendments and Modifications thereto. And colleagues, please, somebody. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mayor, please, I make a motion further reading. <laughs> to introduce the ordinance by title only and waive further reading. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Beach, a second by Council Member O'Brien. Could we please have a roll call? Council Member O'Brien? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. Mayor Ortiz. Yes. And with that, then we can open a public comment. And this is public comment on both items 9A and B. And that's okay to do, Mr. Gina. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble now. Yeah, that's that's fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. And so with that, uh, let's uh, open it to members of the public. I don't have any emails about these two items, nor do I see any hands up. Very good. good. With that, we'll close the public hearing and move on to. And that's it. We just you have direction to bring back the ordinance, correct? Yes, ma'am. We need to um, make motions to bring each of them back for a second reading. Very good. So with that, I'll back to my colleagues. If somebody would like to make a motion on item number 9A to bring it back for further reading. 
May, may we make a motion to do both at once, Mr. City Attorney, or not? Um, I would prefer if you would do not, separate motions. Fine. Thank you. A uh, motion to bring back uh, the first ordinance, 9A. Second. Second. Thank you. With that, we will have roll call and the my vice mayor trying to cut corners again. Gosh. <laughs> That's why they call me the vice mayor, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> mayor of vice. Council member O'Brien. Yes. Council member Beach. Yes. Council member Colson. Yes. Vice mayor Brownrigg. Yes. Mayor Ortiz. Yes. And with that, then we'll move on to item number 9B. But we'll just we need a motion to bring back the ordinance. Motion so, to bring the ordinance. Or either way, go ahead. Go Colleen. ahead, Council Brown. Member Colson. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and make a motion to bring back ordinance 9B. I'll second. We have a motion by Council Member Colson, a second by Council Member O'Brien. Can we have a roll call, please? Council Member O'Brien. Yes. Council Member Beach. Yes. Council Member Colson. Yeah. Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Yes. Mayor Ortiz. Yes. Thank you. And with that, we. I'm sorry. Did somebody help. Yes. I, I just we don't often have um, the pleasure of having Mr. Caro and Ms. Reed here, and I just want to say I'm sure I speak for the whole council, but. Um, you know, we have long debates and hard debates about whether to build something and what to build. But once we make those decisions, they then have to get approved and processed. And I am super proud to hear from people across the Bay Area and even out of state how easy our city is to work with, how efficient our inspectors are, which is why I'm saying this. And you have to strike that balance between making sure we keep the building safe and the public safe, but also help the wheels keep moving. And so many cities, as we're seeing in the press, gum up the works, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And we have a great reputation of being businesslike and efficient. I just want to thank, take this moment to thank um, our, business, our uh, building officials for giving us that reputation. Um, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Colson, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I just also really want to say how much I appreciate that we pay such close attention to our regulations regarding fire safety and other kinds of safety within our structures. Um, I had shared this with uh, Chief Barron um, that a friend of mine over the weekend, uh, he told me that um, his, ent his entire house burned down in the Los Altos Hills, and that was in a matter of... Um, something like 180 seconds, they were dis the, the, at 10 in the morning, we had dispatch, uh, the, the fire departments were out connecting daisy chains, put out a, an enormous house fire and saved the whole canyon in Los Altos Hills. And I know our fire department would react the same and we have to deal with also very hilly and, um, you know, not easy to access infrastructure because we're not just dealing with Burlingame, we're dealing with the hills, we're dealing with um, Hillsborough. And when I read his, uh, he sent me his next door post and I shared it along with the chief um, to see the efficacy with which these departments work and the importance of having uh, fire safety, the fire um, standards and all that. And, and I think most of you know, my grandmother died in a house fire and I'm really, I'm really appreciative of this because, you know, if she had lived today, she would, you know, she would not have passed away in a fire because of all the standards. So I take them seriously and I really appreciate our fire department, just um, all the extra time and our staff they do to make sure we're all safe and we don't lose not just one house, but an entire, you know, area of Burlingame or Hillsborough or Millbrae. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And anybody else before we move on? And having none, then we will move on to our uh, staff reports and communications. And uh, ha, I am so happy to introduce this one. So this is certainly the cherry on top of the whole night. And uh, Mr. Gina, you're smiling, but I'm smiling even more. So with that, I'll pass it on to you for your presentation. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and um, I'll ask if the clerk could promote uh, Karen Murphy, who's our outside counsel uh, as well. And um, the representatives of Topgolf will be here um, to give a short presentation after I give mine. 
Um, so let me share my screen. Just a second. Okay, so can the council members see my screen? All right, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, members of the council. I'm Michael Gina, I'm the city attorney. Um, I'll be presenting um, this agenda item on the top golf approvals. It's been a long road to get here, but uh, here we finally are. Um, so on your screen is the recommended procedure for this evening. Um, we ask that you receive the report from staff and then Topgolf will also have a short presentation and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of both staff and Topgolf. Um, we then recommend that you conduct the public hearing and then you consider the two resolutions um, before you and adopt them in the following order. The first resolution declares the property at 250 Anza Boulevard as exempt surplus land under the Surplus Land Act and makes uh, findings in support of that determination. And then the second resolution is to approve the ground lease between Topgolf and the city. Um, and that resolution also authorizes the city manager to execute any documents and take any further actions um, in uh, support and furtherance of the ground lease. So uh, let me take a, a minute to talk about the background and the timeline and how we got to be where we are today. Um, so the city owns the site at 250 Anza Boulevard. It's currently leased by the city to the operator of the Burlingame Golf Center as a driving range. Back in June of 2016, the city issued a request for proposals or RFP uh, for a uh, operator who would enter into a lease for a recreation or entertainment facility at that site. Uh, in March of 2017, the council selected Top Golf um, to uh, as the preferred vendor for the project. And this was based on Topgolf's RFP proposal to construct a new golf-centered commercial recreation and sports complex, which would be open to the public. Um, in June of 2017, the city council approved a term sheet um, and authorized negotiation of the ground lease. And the term sheet would be the basis uh, for the ground lease and would cover deal terms such as uh, length of the lease, rent, community benefits, and operations. In May of 2018, the City Council approved a written exclusive negotiating agreement or ENA with Topgolf. And oops, sorry about that, too fast. Um, the um, ENA requires the parties to negotiate exclusively for the development of the ground lease. So the city uh, obligated itself not to go negotiate or entertain any offers from any other entity relating to the site. And the parties um, also agreed to negotiate diligently towards uh, developing the ground lease. And uh, the ENA expired at the end of um, 2018. Between 2018 and 2020, um, the to uh, Top Golf began to the process of obtaining its land use entitlements. And at the same time, um, the city underwent environmental review required under CEQA for the project. So during this period between 2018 and 2020, even though the written ENA had expired, the city still acted as if the ENA was in place. And in, in fact, the city took concrete actions in furtherance of the ENA. So the city adopted resolutions which approved contracts for environmental review for the project. It held public hearings for design and environmental scoping. And it consulted with other governmental agencies that, have, that would have regulatory authority over the site. And throughout this entire period, the city and Topgolf continuously negotiated exclusively on the terms of the ground lease. And, and as, as I said, in effect, the parties acted as if the written a ENA was still in effect and were continuously to develop the ground lease. And this is important when we talk about the uh, surplus land exemption in just a minute. Um, so um, moving on to May of 2020, the Planning Commission approved the land use entitlements for the project and no appeal was um, filed. Um, and so those, uh, so those approvals um, became finalized. Um, so let me um, just quickly go over a few graphics um, of the project site and the project. Um, so to orient you, North is at the left side of the screen here. Um, Airport Boulevard is at the top of the screen. Anza Boulevard is along here. And the Burlingame Golf Center is right in the middle. Um, with Murray Field uh, uh, adjacent to the south, um, the parking lot right here, and then the Doubletree Hotel um, south of Murray Field. 
Um, I'll show you a couple of graphics um, of the approved project uh, that was okayed by the Planning Commission. Um, so this is Top Golf's proposal to uh, construct a new golf-centered recreation and sports complex. Um, they'll construct a new three-story building of approximately 71,000 square feet with 102 hitting bays, a restaurant, outdoor dining, indoor event space, and associated parking. Um, and this is just one more graphic of the site that shows the um, outdoor areas as well as the indoor areas. And the hitting bays are seen through um, the glass here. Um, so uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the Surplus Land Act. Um, so uh, first, and the first resolution before you declares uh, the project site as exempt surplus land. So the Surplus Land Act is uh, a statute that's codified in the government code and it prioritizes the development of affordable housing, open space, and schools. And the statute provides that unless an exemption applies, the local agency, which includes Burlingame, must offer any surplus land to developers of affordable housing, open space, or school districts. Um, in um, January of 2020, AB 1486 came into effect, and that statute made changes to the Surplus Land Act with the goal of further encouraging the development of housing and open space. Um, it expanded the definition of disposal of surplus land to include not just the selling of property, but also any leases of five years or, or greater. And um, AB 1486 also requires the agency to declare any property as surplus or exempt surplus and adopt written findings prior to dispossession of that surplus land. If, a land, if, if the property in question is not, found, is not determined to be exempt, then the agency must offer that property uh, to developers of housing, open space, or schools prior to disposing it to any other type of entity, such as a commercial developer. AB 1486 does have an exemption, um, and that is for um, exclusive negotiating agreements entered into prior to September 30th, 2019. The agency must still declare the property as surplus or exempt surplus and make those written findings. Um, and it must also dispose of the property by December 31st, 2022. So how does all of that relate to the Topgolf project? So the Topgolf project site is subject to the Surplus Land Act. And so therefore, before the city can enter into the ground lease with Topgolf, the city council must first declare the property as surplus or exempt surplus land and make the appropriate findings. Um, staff believes that the Topgolf project is exempt uh, from AB 1486 because the city and Top Golf entered into that written ENA prior to the September 30th, 2019 cutoff date. And even though the written ENA had expired on December, uh, at the end of 2018, the party still acted as if the ENA was still in effect. So they continued to negotiate exclusively with each other. They took actions in furtherance of the ENA and, and, and they acted as if it was still going on. Um, this determination of exemption is also supported uh, by, state, by the State um, Housing and Community Development Department. So in uh, 2021, um, the city attorney's office uh, requested guidance from HCD um, about the applicability of the exemption to our particular set of facts. And HCD uh, came back with written confirmation that the exemption does in fact apply based on the written ENA that the city and Topgolf had entered into. Um, that determination letter is attached as, a, as an exhibit to your staff report. Um, and um, HCD confirmed that while the written confirmation um, still applies, um, we still have to make uh, the appropriate findings and we must dispose of the site, i.e. enter into the ground lease with Topgolf um, prior to December 31st of this year for that exemption to stick. Um, so that was the Surplus Land Act. Um, portion, I'm now going to go into the ground lease itself and talk about some of the deal points. Um, and so the first one is uh, the term of the lease. So after the ground lease has been executed, um, tenant Top Golf has up to two years to commence construction um, of the project. Uh, before, uh, up until the time that the city receives notice um, of the commencement, the city will, uh, will have control over the site. And so the city may continue to lease uh, the golf center to the current operator. Top Golf will pay no rent. 
Um, however, once the city receives notice of commencement of construction, the city then has 30 days to deliver the vacant site to the tenant. The initial term of the ground lease is 20 years, and it also provides for up to four extension terms of five years each, so up to an additional 20 years in extension um, for a total uh, term of the ground lease of up to 40 years. Uh, next, I'll talk about rent, fees, and taxes. Um, so during the construction period, Top Golf will pay the city $5,000 a month in rent. If the um, construction takes longer than two years, then that amount will be increased by CPI at a, a rate of between three and 5%. Um, once uh, the project has been completed and is operational, Top Golf will, be, will pay um, yearly rent and in monthly installments uh, based on where we are in um, the years going into the ground lease as shown here um, on this slide. Um, in addition to rent, Topgolf will pay the city um, a community benefits fee totaling $500,000. Um, they will also pay the city a commercial linkage fee of $350,000, um, which represents um, its mitigation of impacts to the city's housing supply based on the commercial development of the property. Um, in addition, Top Golf will pay all applicable real estate taxes and assessments that are levied against the site. Um, I'll spend a minute to talk about the, cha the change of use option and new facility option. Um, so the approved facility is the facility that was um, approved by the Planning Commission um, for the golf-centered entertainment use with the approved design that I showed you on the, slides, on, on the, on the slide uh, earlier. Um, However, uh, given the length of the ground lease, which is up to 40 years, the parties anticipated that there may be a change in the marketability of an entertainment value, uh, venue. So in some of the outer years, it's possible that a golf-centered entertainment facility, such as the Top Golf product, may no longer be marketable, and it may be um, advantageous to uh, change that use. And, and it's advantageous from the city's perspective because we want a continuously operating facility there. Um, and so the parties have negotiated a change of use option in the ground lease. Um, beginning in year 10 after opening the facility, um, uh, Top Golf may exercise its change of use option and propose a different uh, uh, entertainment use out there. Um, if they exercise that option, then Topgolf will need to comply with all laws that are in place at the time um, that the option is exercised. So whatever our general plan is, our municipal code and our zoning ordinance says at the time will be the regulatory requirements that Topgolf will be um, submitting their application under. Um, in addition, if the change of use um, requires additional land use approvals and or environmental review under CEQA, then Topgolf um, will have to comply with those requirements. Um, and then Topgolf will also need to pay any fee, any associated fees at the then applicable rates. In addition, regardless of uh, whatever uses are allowed under the then current general plan or zoning, at the time that the option is exercised, the following uses would be prohibited at the project site. Um, so private members only uses would be prohibited and the, any change of use would be, must be open to the public generally. Um, also prohibited would be any uses that allow guns, firearms, or weapons of any kind. So no shooting ranges, no ax throwing ranges, for example. Um, in addition, uh, no nightclubs or dance clubs would be allowed at the site and any new use um, cannot be age restricted. And so again, it must be any new use must be open to all ages and to the public generally. As part of the change of use um, option, Topgolf may also opt to build a new facility rather than use the existing or the, the approved facility. And if Topgolf does opt to, to build that new facility, they must um, apply for and receive all pertinent land use approvals and pay all applicable fees at the then current rates as well as comply with all then applicable laws. And finally, they must complete construction of that new facility within three years. Um, landfill permits. So the project site sits on a closed landfill with a clay cap. 
and the site is subject to a post-closure plan and landfill permits that are issued by several, several regulatory agencies, including the Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, County Environmental Health, and Cal Recycle. And the city is the permittee um, of, of those regulatory permits. Um, as a result of building the project, um, it will probably require amendments to the post-closure plan and to those landfill permits. Um, and so uh, tenant Top Golf will pay for the costs of processing those amendments and the city will remain the permittee. Um, in addition, um, under the um, current post-closure plan and permits, um, the city is obligated to provide um, monitoring and reporting to the regulatory agencies. Um, and there is a cost associated with that. Um, any, as, a res as a result of the project, any um, additional costs to the monitoring and reporting that are required as a result of the amendment to the post-closure plan and the landfill permits will be borne by Topgolf. And then finally, um, the parties will cooperate in um, providing that monitoring data and reporting data to the regulatory agency that would be required under those landfill permits. Um, talk a little bit about the construction phase. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the tenant has up to two years to commence construction. And then once they've commenced construction, they have up to five years to complete, to complete construction. Um, Topgolf has agreed to pay prevailing wage for the for construction of the project. And then in terms of construction traffic, um, the parties will ag have agreed uh, to develop a to develop a set of traffic control plans during the construction period to minimize impacts to the adjacent property users, uh, such as Murray Field users and um, and visitors to the DoubleTree Hotel. Um, and then Topgolf will also provide an on-site construction manager so that owners and users of adjacent properties have a real person um, to call if there are issues that arise. Um, in addition, um, construction of the project will require the city to provide um, temporary construction easements to Topgolf so that they can access the construction site during this phase. And then also uh, the city will uh, be required to provide easements to Topgolf um, during the operational period. So once the property is open and operating, Topgolf will also have um, the need for um, easements to uh, access the site. Um, one thing of note about these operational easements, Topgolf has the right but not the obligation to build a secondary access road to the project site from Airport Boulevard. And I'll show these easements in the next graphic. You can see that. So to orient you again, North is on the left side of the screen here. Airport Boulevard is on the top here. Um, the project area site is marked in the dashed lines here. Uh, the new building is here. And so people will be hitting golf balls in this sort of southeasterly direction. Um, Murray Field is here. Um, so the shaded areas are um, shown here in the solid gray and the hash, um, hash, hash mark um, um, text. Um, and so the construction easements are shown um, in the solid gray areas, and then the access easements during the operational period are shown um, in, in the hash marks here. Um, this is the access off of Airport Boulevard. And again, they'll have a construction easement um, shown in solid gray here and then a potential secondary access road during the operational period shown in um, hatches here. Um, spend a minute to talk about environmental analysis and CEQA. Um, so the Planning Commission approved a mitigated negative declaration or MND for the project as part of its uh, project, as part of its land use approvals in May of 2020. Uh, the MND studied uh, potential environmental impacts from the project and imposed certain mitigation measures which were incorporated as conditions of approval for the project. Um, since, the city, uh, since the Planning Commission approved the MND, no new information or changes to the project have occurred which would trigger additional CEQA review. And so no additional CEQA analysis is necessary as a result of uh, adopting the ground lease tonight. Um, finally, I'm almost done here. Finally, um, the resolution 
which authorizes uh, signing of the ground lease, also authorizes the city manager to execute any related documents in, further of the ground, in furtherance of the ground lease, and that would include the escrow agreement and the cross access easement agreement. Um, so, and then, um, uh, and again, it would authorize uh, the city manager to take any further actions um, in, in, in um, pursuit of the ground lease. Um, so in conclusion, um, you know, this has been a long time in coming. Approval of the resolutions is a major milestone towards redevelopment of the golf center site, which the city, you know, process that the city council kicked off back in 2016. It's our hope that um, the Top Golf project will represent a new recreational and restaurant venue um, for local and regional entertainment for residents and visitors to the city, um, especially guests at the local hotels. Um, it provides additional revenues to the city, safeguards operations at the landfill site, um, and allows for active use and more active use on the city's bayfront. I'd also like to take a, a second here to acknowledge all of the hard work from all of the city teams in getting us to this point. Uh, this really was a team effort in bringing um, this ground lease to the council before tonight. Um, and so I really appreciate all of the staff time and expertise that went into this, um, particularly from the public works department, Parks and Rec, Community Development, the City Manager's Office, um, and the City Attorney's Office was here to support as well. So I, I just wanted to, to make that note. Um, and with that, I will stop talking um, and stop sharing. And um, let me pause here. Um, uh, Top Golf is also here, and I think they'd like to say a few words as well. Very good. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, who will be speaking for Top Golf? Uh, Mr. Wetterin. Uh, good, e good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Scott Wetterin. I'm the Director of Development for Top Golf. Along with me is a colleague of mine, Eric Ubler with Arco Murray. Um, just wanted to say that Eric and I appreciate the collaboration that has taken place between us and the city staff that started way back in 2016 up until today. And we're just incredibly thankful to be at this juncture right now requesting your approval of this ground lease. Um, Eric and I are both here to answer any questions um, should you guys have any, but appreciate the time. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, so with that, we are ready to go to questions, but before we do that, just a reminder uh, to members of the public, we have had many, many meetings uh, about this topic. We've had, uh, well, as the process went along, we've uh, talked about the details with our city attorney. Um, I remember way back when, when we sat with council member Colson and myself and uh, some staff members to, to kind of out negotiate the original uh, uh, deal. Uh, and we've come a long way and there's gonna be a lot of hours put in by our staff and by Top Golf. And um, this is just a really important day for Burlingame. I'm very glad to be here. And I wanna thank everybody for all their hard work. Uh, and that's just to say also that we have looked at the details many times before this. So um, if there are not a lot, a lot of questions, it's because we have dealt with before in both open and closed sessions. So with that, I will hand it to my colleagues for any questions of staff. And I see Council Member Colson. Thank you. So uh, just first to staff and then to Top Golf. So. Lisa, I just want to, um, again, um, go over and remind myself, uh, the funds from this lease generation and, and everything will go into the general fund Correct. and the, in the community benefit money, we will, um, that will, we will determine what, how, how will we determine what will that be used for? Or have you already sl slotted that for something? Uh, we haven't yet uh, that I recall the community benefit funds. It's not enough to do like a full project. So, but we are kind of saving our pennies to do some work out on um, old Bay shore and out on the Bayfront in general. So it may be that that would be a, you know, a nice nexus to put it into one of those projects out by the Bayfront. Great. I, I think that's, I think that's really um, important and that, that they're putting in money, but that will, you know, help with what, whatever, whether it's traffic flow or um, safety issues or anything out there on the Bayfront would be great. And to talk golf, um, either Scott or Eric, 
So how are you, is, is your business model, which has now been around for maybe 10, 15 years, I'm guessing, is in Callaway, I know, purchased you. Um, are you continuing to see enthusiastic participation from the community? And in that vein, I think there was one other little deal term that wasn't articulated because it's probably very small, but I think one of the issues was we're tearing up the um, center where are currently our women's Burlingame High School uh, women's golf team trains. And so I think you had insisted that you would be open to hosting the Burlingame women's golf team in the future when you're rebuilt and uh, making sure they have a place locally to train. I just wanted to reconfirm that. Yeah, I think we uh, we have partnerships on pretty much all of our venues for especially like local local programs or middle or high school programs that are able to come to the venue uh, on weekdays. Uh, I forget the hour exactly, but I think it's between basically noon and 430 and uh, are able to use the venue for little to no cost. So. OK, yeah, I, I, I we should probably confirm that uh, city attorney Gina, just make sure that's in there, because as I recall, they usually train from like three thirty to like four thirty or five. And we just might I just don't want to get in a situation down the road where it's not been clear and we don't have that somehow documented. I was over at the high school the other day and they were very excited about it. I think there were like uh, 40 girls that tried out for freshman golf this year so or you know, the golf team this year. And then Scott, Eric, you guys are seeing the same, you're seeing sort of robust demand continuing for the facility and enthusiasm. I know um, your closest one will be, I think, in San Jose. Yeah, that's right. I think San Jose is the closest venue. Um, and then now there's what two open in the Los Angeles area and Ontario and El Segundo. Um, Roseville's been open for a while and there's I mean, there's a lot, you know, I think when I started working on this project and kudos to the city for everything that's gone into it, you know, I've been involved in the past five plus years, the, the number of venues that Top Golf has opened each year has increased at least one to two venues per year over the last, um, yeah, five years. I know with Callaway recently changing their name to Top Golf Callaway brands as well. Yeah, the, the enthusiasm is just continuing. They're expanding internationally as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of lot of runway for this concept, and um, you know, to to know Scott at faults, I think on on as far as the the Brewing Game High School Women's Golf Team, there's there's been a lot of people involved in this, so um, let let's certainly follow up on that. But, yeah, that'd be great. Well, thank you very much. I I want to welcome you. Um, this is, I'm, I've been very passionate around women's sports at Brewing Game High. I'm excited you're going to be here. I think our hotels are excited to have you here. I hope you'll expeditiously get the shovels in the ground and get going because I think the community, I, I can tell you the one question I've been asked every single time mm -hmm. anywhere is when's Top Golf going to open? <laughs> so I think having definitive answer for that and getting your signage and everything, the community is incredibly enthusiastic. Well, and I can say Top Golf's just as enthusiastic about this location. Um, just for for context, it, it's pretty uncommon that we're in the middle of permitting and having released the the spend for that design before leases executed and approved. So they're, uh, they've, they've shown a lot of, a lot of commitment and yeah, it's been a long time coming. We're pretty, we're pretty excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you. And you know what? It's funny. That is the first question we always get asked is when is top golf coming? So yeah, uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, so thank you for that. I think council member beach was up. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks to everybody's hard work. Um, question probably for Mr. Gardner, but I was just referencing back to the original term sheet. Um, and there was a vision for a lead silver building. Is, our, is that the direction we're headed with this building uh, that went through the Planning Commission? Yeah, so uh, first of all, that is uh, described in the project description that was included in the Environmental Review Initial Study NEGDEC. Um, it mentions the lead and equivalency and then the different measures. And then in the most recent uh, building permit um, submittal, there is a sheet in there with the lead checklist and it is showing um, exceeding lead silver. Um, staff does need to confirm that. Um, we have a green building specialist on the building division um, team that um, will be looking over that, but uh, everything appears to be on track for that commitment. 
Great, that's that's something to celebrate. The other two quick things I saw on the term sheet, there was a vision um, that security, that the tenant will provide its own security at Top Golf. Is that still, Mr. Wettering, is that still your model, how you intend to go forward? Unless I missed it in the, um, in, in the lease terms, it might not be something that's appropriate for the lease term, but just wanted to check on your vision. I'm sorry, the, the vision regarding security? That you have, that uh, the tenant provides its own security? Yeah, well, we yeah we provide the, our own security during the phase of construction as well as when we're open. Yeah, when you're open, great. And then the the other, I know we had a great presentation from our city attorney, talked a lot about traffic during construction. Um, certainly, we'll have a lot more cars out there, and so um, hope we'll operate in good faith. There's a lot of great resources for traffic and TDM management with organizations like commute.org and our shuttle systems. So uh, hopefully our staff can get you folks in touch and really uh, creatively address that and try to get people, particularly with two major rail stations, three even coming. Um, that, that's another great opportunity for people to get to Top Golf that maybe don't need an automobile. So thanks for hopefully your vision is to work uh, on that as well, how to get people there through potential shuttles too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member O'Brien. Uh, thank you through the mayor. Um, actually, Council Member Beach touched upon the TDM that I was concerned about. Um, but my other <coughs> question was, and I think there was a conversation a couple of years back on this. Do you still plan on trying to hire as many Burlingame locals as possible for Top Golf? For I guess for full for the full time or part time yeah, employees. Part time, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean there will be. I mean, Top Golf typically has a you know a big push for hiring and and obviously local hiring as part of that as part you know prior leading up to grand opening. Um, yeah, I don't. I I can't admittedly can't say if I was a part of any conversations about a, a commitment to a certain percentage of of local hires, but. Um, Scott, I don't know if there's any initiatives that you've heard. Um, I was just going to say, pro prototypically on a venue hire, I mean, we have our um, rally events that we help. We have uh, um, prior to opening, and I mean, all those rally events are held locally for all of our the service staff and whatnot. So, I mean, if we're having four, 450 employees at a venue such as uh, this size, um, you figured maybe 50 to 75 are going to be management uh, level employees and the rest are going to be um, the service industry, with either kitchen, barbacks or waiting and uh, staff such as that. And all those people will be sourced locally. So um, assuming they apply for the job and they get hired, yeah. then, you know, that should be a pretty large percentage. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I wasn't asking for any sort of percentage. I, I was just hoping, and I just remember vaguely, um, at some point there was a conversation about this that we would try at least to get as many locals as, as possible. I know you don't have control over the amount of people who apply and so forth, but at least that it's you know advertised and that people know. Yeah, we, we typically would have a hiring event either at the venue itself and uh, encourage people to come out or if the, the space is not ready, they would rent a local space in the immediate area and have the hiring events there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I want to start by uh, thanking uh, Top Golf for putting the hitting base where you are. So we will now be hitting not into the setting sun, not into the wind and downhill. So on day one, we'll all be better golfers. So thank you for that. Um, I will say that all of us on council have been looking forward to this, as the mayor said, uh, and I think we all held faith, but it's been hard because this has taken a lot longer than I think we expected. And so what I'm curious what you think the opening date is, and I guess I'll just leave it there. What do you think the opening date is and what can we do to help expedite it? Well, yeah, I think we're, you know, we're hoping to have the test. Scott, Scott asked me all the time what the opening date's going to be. There's, we've still got some outstanding permits to resolve, um, specifically on the landfill. Um, and so there is going to be a, an extended construction duration. I mean, I, we're hoping to be open in 2024. Um, we just need some, some things to 
come together here over the next couple of months to finalize the permits and then get out of the ground. Let us know. Appreciate the Excellent. help. If there's any way to make the site no longer a landfill, that would be a big help. But <laughs> we'll we'll get right on that. <laughs> but want to make want to make sure the plan is is right for the long term. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, I look forward to having it. It's not only the revenue that will come from the lease, but the uh, added attraction for our hotels that it will help us with occupancy. So very very important project for the bayfront, for the whole city, for our, our uh, budget. So I appreciate it. With that, then I will open it to members of the public for any questions that uh, we may have from the public or any issues. I don't have any emails and I don't see any hands up, Mr. Mayor. Very good, then I'll bring it right back to colleagues um, for any final comments uh, and then we can go into making a motion. So colleagues, anybody have final comments? I think we've talked about this for six years, it's time to get it to bed. So with that, uh, we will start with the adoption of a resolution. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, you have Council Member Beach's hand is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Member Beach, I'm sorry. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Since we have some discussion, I just want to appreciate staff's um, presentation tonight and hard work. And certainly, I think the research and the due diligence on the partial, um, whether or not the parcel is exempt from the surplus, and, uh, surplus land act seems clear that with a letter of affirmation from HCD that it does meet that standard. So we appreciate uh, the city attorney's office going the extra mile. Um, no, I just, I, I wanna say, you know, to this project, congratulations for all, all the teamwork, a lot of people involved. Uh, back in 2017, I know that, um, you know, I, I was on record expressing concerns about uh, this, this particular uh, top golf coming on this particular parcel, not coming to Burlingame. It's a great thing coming to Burlingame. Um, had concerns about the parcel, you know, although I still have some of those concerns remain, I just want to really acknowledge how there has been tremendous hard work uh, from Top Golf, from staff, from the city council subcommittee, from the city council, past and present staff to really mitigate concerns and to make the, a, a great, uh, uh, the best possible deal for Burlingame and really um, address the needs of Top Golf. So I want to congratulate um, everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gina, you want to lead us and tell me what we do now so I don't get in trouble? <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I recommend that the council uh, first take up the resolution uh, declaring the property as exempt surplus and making this the um, uh, supporting findings. Very good. Thank you. Colleagues, anybody would care to take that one on and make, give us a, resol a, a motion to approve that resolution? saying that the property is exempt from the surplus land? I'll go ahead and make that motion. I'd like to make a motion that the Burlingame City Council acknowledge that the um, Top Golf site as indicated in the staff report is exempt from the Surplus Land Act as verified by outside agencies. I'll second. Great, that was a great motion. Thank you, motion by Council Member Colson, second by Council Member O'Brien. And with that, if we could have a roll call, Madam City Clerk. Council Member O'Brien? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. Mayor Ortiz? Yes. And now we move on to the ground lease. So what we're looking for is a motion to adopt the resolution of the City Council of the City of Burlingame approving a ground lease between the City of Burlingame and Top Golf USA Burlingame LLC for the property at 250 Anza Boulevard and authorizing the city manager to execute and take actions in furtherance of the ground lease. Secret review mitigated negative declaration previously adopted on May 11, 2020, except under the secret guidelines 15061B3. Woo, so fun. moved. <laughs> I have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. I have a motion by Council Member O'Brien and a second by Vice Mayor Brownrick. Can we please have a roll call? Council Member O'Brien? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Vice Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. Mayor Ortiz? Yes. <laughs> Congratulations, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for all the hard work. This is really, really an important day. Top Golf, thank you guys for being here tonight with us and sharing your thoughts. 
Uh, Mr. Gina, I'll leave you alone now. Thank you for everything. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great day. Uh, let's move on to the next item. So see if I can find it underneath all of this. Give me just a second. And we are moving to item number 10B, which is consideration of a housing fund assistance to a proposed affordable housing development at 1875 California Drive. And I believe it's Mr. Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mayor Ortiz and members of the council. Uh, in 2017, the city council adopted an ordinance establishing commercial linkage fees for new commercial development in Burlingame. Uh, these fees are collected to support and build new homes for new residents and in particular lower income residents who would be part of the workforce for the new commercial development. The fees can be used for a variety of purposes, including land purchase, construction costs, site rehabilitation, uh, or project financing related to providing workforce housing. As was discussed in the study session at the last council meeting, an advisory committee is being formed to discuss the use and prioritization of housing funds. Uh, the first meeting is anticipated to be in late 2022 or early 2023 of that committee. Uh, meanwhile, the city has been approached with a request to provide funding assistance towards a proposed 69-unit affordable housing development at 1875 California Drive at the corner of Truesdale, known as the Eucalyptus Grove Apartments. Uh, the amount of funding being requested is approximately $1,432,000, which would cover the anticipated development impact fees for the project. Uh, while the intention of the Housing Fund Advisory Committee is to discuss the use and prioritization of housing funds for application fees, such as Eucalyptus Grove Apartments, that committee is not anticipated to have recommendations until later in 2023. Uh, however, time is of the essence with this project as they have applied to the County of San Mateo's SuperNOFA, that stands for Notice of Funds Availability, uh, and awards are scheduled to be made this coming December 2022. Um, in preliminary scoring, this project is ranking high, particularly in that the application is already submitted to the city, and if all goes well, construction could commence relatively soon. Uh, the, super, so, the SuperNOFA is very competitive, and county staff have indicated to city staff uh, that the application would be more competitive if the city were able to make the financial contribution, um, and county staff have suggested the fee waiver or equivalent. Uh, the applicant has suggested a couple of financing options as a means to initiate discussion, and those are described in the staff report. Um, there are advantages to a loan rather than a fee waiver, and the applicant can go into more detail on that. Uh, the applicant is in attendance and will provide a short overview of the proposed project, as well as the fund's request. Uh, but before hearing from the applicant, please let me know if there are any questions of staff. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Uh, colleagues, any questions of uh, Mr. Gardner of staff? Uh, uh, May Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just wanna ask staff, um, and I know the answer to this, but, but I wanna ask the staff whether this project will come before uh, the city's planning commission or city council um, in any other format than, than this one. In this instance, no, uh, this project is a 100% affordable housing uh, development that was submitted under Senate Bill 35, which allows a ministerial review of a qualifying project. Uh, so staff will be doing a plan check, which uh, will be checking to see if uh, the project meets the zoning standards and the objective design standards that are in place. Um, provided it does meet those standards, then it would be approved. Um, there would not be a hearing before the planning commission or city council, and, and that's uh, that's a particular aspect of the state law. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Um, and colleagues, anybody else? Okay, and with that, then we could bring the uh, applicant up and have them do their presentation. Um, hi, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Member. Do I have permission to share a screen? Uh, I'm so, not sure who would that. Yes, you do. Give? Okay. okay. I will share my screen. Um, give me one second.
Please let me know if you can see my PowerPoint. Yes, <laughs> I'm thinking of yes. Yes. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Maisie Leong, and I'm a senior project manager with Allied Housing and Boat Services, a co-developer with CRP Affordable. My colleague Eli um, and the CRP team is also online, so they're available for any questions. Um, I believe they've communicated with everyone here. And as a former high school girls golf team, I'm really excited to hear what you guys are doing before, but I'm also excited to share what we're doing here in Burlingame. Um, so today I wanted to do a quick presentation um, on the project, which many of you are familiar with already. I'll do a quick introduction, who we are as co-developers, uh, project overview, design, funding sources, and our schedule. And then we'll take any questions um, at the end with my colleague from CRP. So Allied Housing, um, we're a permanent supportive housing developer based in the city of Fremont. We're a subsidiary of both services, service provider for homeless um, in the Bay Area for about 35 years. And we have about, actually more than that now, I would say about 15, 16 projects um, in the Bay Area. So South Bay, North Bay, East Bay. And um, we do have two development projects in Santa Clara, some in San Jose. And so we build a lot of housing in the region and also have integrated quality services and property management um, on site. So these are some of our recent completed projects, very recent. Uh, so we have 145 studio homes, um, another one in the city of Fremont, 60 homes, and this is just completed this year, and uh, another one in Fremont. And with us, we have CRP uh, Affordable, who's our co-developer, which you guys are familiar with as well. They're for-profit affordable housing development firms, and they also work in um, different regions um, in the state of California, as well as across the state or across the country. So a little bit about the site context, you'll see the red square is the site and it's close to a lot of different um, amenities, you know, walkable community. It's one block from the Millbrae BART station. So it's very close. And you'll see some of these site photos here. Um, a quick overview it is a new construction project. It's about eight story, uh, five stories, a wood frame over three story podium parking. It's going to be a tax rate of financing. So we're going to have different financing from the state, from the city, from the county, um, as well as investors. And we have 69 units. All of it is 100% affordable. And we have about 18 units serving for homeless veterans, making sure we serve our local community members. And we're going to have studios, one bedroom, two bedrooms, um, and three bedrooms units, so family units. And usually our income range is, is between 20 to 50% AMI. So folks that are um, definitely need support and also um, wanting to age in place, for instance, as well as veterans. So these are some of our renderings. You'll see this photo or this rendering and a little bit more um, renderings on this angle. And on the ground floor, we have uh, landscaping as well as the second floor podium. So we wanna make sure we have enough amenities and landscaping places designed for our residents. And this is a typical floor plan that you're gonna see um, above the podium parking, our typical unit floor plan. Our funding sources, um, because we really value public-private partnership, both from the state, local, county, and city jurisdictions, as well as our development Fund partners and our funders, um, we do leverage a lot of different public subsidies. So on the state level, we have multifamily housing program, which is MHP for short. We also have um, VHIP, we call them VHIP, um, Veteran Housing and Homelessness Prevention State Program that we're seeking funding competitively for. And then what um, uh, city staff had just mentioned, the County of San Mateo um, funding that we applied for and we're most likely uh, um, will receive funding for. And overall, the project schedule, um, site control of the project um, 2021 in Q, Q3, Q4, uh, we're expecting, or we have obtained land use approval in summer of 2022 this year. And we are seeking um, actively funding for construction and permit financing summer again. And we're expecting to start construction in Q3, Q4 next year and complete in beginning of 2025, the full affordable housing timeline, and um, expecting all the program funding to be fully dispersed at uh, 
fall of 2025. And so we really appreciate your time joining us for this short presentation. If you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out to me or um, Seth and Eli from CRP Affordable. Our emails are here and we look forward to partnering with you guys and have our rules turned together. And thank you very much. And with that thank said, you. I will invite the rest if there's any questions that we can answer. Very good. Colleagues, I see Council Member O'Brien. Just a quick question. You may not know the answer yet, but I was just curious, what's the range of square footage for the units? Thank you for that question. I'm going to ask um, Eli's team to share the specifics. And Eli has raised his hand. Let me promote him to panelist so he okay. can. Yeah. Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, so the unit sizes should range from, from about 650 to 1100. Great. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Um, I have um, another point I'll make after we open it up to public comment, but um, in light of having our the applicant here, does, I guess the point is we're here. First of all, I really appreciate the overview. Um, is it really three stories of podium parking? Is that right? Is it three? It's, it's three three stories of podium. The parking is inside of that. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize it was that's great. Um, so super exciting project, and obviously filling a gaping hole in the peninsula. So um, hats off. Um, there is the question that's before us about financing. And I didn't know if um, we wanted to ask the applicant, Mr. Gardner, to make the, you know, to sort of spell out the different choice, choices that this council has and whether and how to support the project, or um, is that later on? I just didn't know if we should give the applicant a chance to to weigh in before they sign off on, on the comments. I think that can be helpful. Um, I do wanna also remind the council, we're not looking, we're looking for direction. So the big question is, is this, you know, is the council uh, interested in um, allocating funds towards this project? And then um, there would need to be um, a follow-up and resolution and all those kinds of things. Um, but I think in order to um, help the council uh, make that kind of determination, uh, certainly yeah, we should hear from the uh, the applicant and and they've put forward a couple of different um, financing options. It's not to say those are the only ones, but those were two that they suggested they thought uh, could work for this project. And, and the two that we have before us are a loan versus a fee waiver. Am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. And, and one, you know, the fee waiver may, it may be a fee waiver or it may be a reimbursement of fees. It's there's, I was just going to ask <laughs> to go so. totally into the weeds. Yeah. There, there's advantages um, as well for how that's structured. But I think for simplicity, we say you're covering the fees. And, and but so, so yeah. And I'm glad you said that because that was my follow up question. The, the, the million four would still come out of our, our housing fund. That's correct. And okay. that, that's why it's important to distinguish, you know, fee waiver, we still need to backfill those fees because it, it, they are paying for impacts from the development. Um, so it would be a, a sort of reimbursement type thing. Yeah, I think you hit it in the, in the nail in the head. It's a fee reimbursement more than a fee waiver. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see council member Colson. Thank you very much, um, Mayor. Um, so I just really quickly wanted to give a little tiny moment of background. I serve on the HCDC committee, Housing Community Development Committee for San Mateo County. Unfortunately, I'm very sorry um, to our colleagues here today, um, to Ms. Long and Mr. Wise. I was at a funeral during the actual presentation, but I did do the study session. And um, what, what I... 
I found so compelling about this, uh, this project received so much positive review from everybody at the HCDC. It, it's one of the four, there were probably 10 to 12 projects presented. It's in the top four. And I was really thrilled to see like the number of the unit composition and the unit mix, um, the two bedrooms and three bedroom family units, um, the, uh, the uh, 18 units for homeless vets, very exciting. Um, and I just wanna confirm with you, it sounds to me and what the report back we got from the, from the HCDC was, one of the concerns or questions and funding considerations was the lack of city funding and commitment or fee waivers. So that seems this seems to be a very important missing piece of your capital stack. And um, if can you can you tell me if the city didn't do this work for you or help you on this, how, how would you pull this financing together? That's a really good question, and it's a position that we I guess collectively have been put in by the county. Um, and they've actually made a recommendation to decrease our requested award by the amount of money that we're talking about with you guys today. Um, so there, there's a there's a gap there now. And um, I guess you know, in theory, there's a number of ways we can fill it, but this is the the first way we're we're trying to. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry, can you clarify that this amount came uh, from a it was like a revisit by the county of the amount they were willing to finance? Uh, yeah. So, so I can go into that just a bit. So we are, you know, we have $48 million. We have to allocate the requests are usually something on the order of a hundred million. So these dollars are very precious. And um, so projects rank and scoring. And it looks to me based on the conversation we had at the HCDC, <laughs> that um, in order to incentivize the city of Burlingame to step in and participate, um, they, I think the, the allocation had been something around 7 million. The request million, was seven, yeah. Right, $7 million request. And they were talking around $6 million. And then I think what they did was in, in order to make these dollars go a little further, they're saying, hey, you know, we'd really like to see the city of Burlingame figure out a way to participate in this project as do all the other cities. We're not being singled out or picked on at any sense of the imagination. Most cities do have affordable housing funds and fees that they've been putting into these projects. So um, the, the decrease is really just to encourage the city to try to figure out creatively and innovatively how to, how to fill that gap. So we're consistent with what other cities do and so that the county can leverage the dollars to build you know, and magnify and amplify those for more units throughout the county. Right. Would that, I think that's a, uh, Eli, it's a probably fair characteristic, characterization. Yeah. I agree with everything you just said. Okay, uh, Council Member Colson, thank you for the color. And uh, with that, uh, Vice Mayor Brown -Rig. Mr. Mayor, I've spoken. I do have another comment, but um, Councilwoman Beach has her hand up too. Council Member Beach. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. No, very exciting project. Echo Councilmember Colson's comments um, and seeing such low AMIs is really inspiring. Love the veteran stuff too. Um, my question, I guess I'll tag on the financing question. It, uh, big picture, it looks like there's the loan option versus fee waiver. The staff report suggested the loan option works better for the project. Um, that certainly sounds reasonable. I was curious about the interest rate that was proposed and is that um, was there some thought behind that? Does it make sense to have a, a, is that the right interest rate for the project? Would it make sense to have a lower interest rate or is there a discussion around that? If we uh, I, a fee waiver? Yeah, I think we would certainly be interested in a lower interest rate. <laughs> um, yeah, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the terms that we suggested were um, suggested to match the terms of the loan that we're gonna get from the county or that we expect Got to get it. from the county. So, you know, while this also fills the gap, it'll also just line up really nicely with the money that we were hoping to get from the county. So just, you know, for the sake of our financial model, it, it kind of just fits a plug. That works. Okay. That was That's, created. Yeah. That makes sense. My second question, you mentioned the three levels of, of podium parking. I know there's been some legislation recently that's 
come down? Is, is the project set in stone? Are you uh, considering changing any of the parking proposal or is this what is this uh, the three levels where, where you're headed with this project? Uh, this is where we're headed. We're, I would say, very close to uh, full entitlement approval. Uh, we're deep in that process and hope to be done with it soon. Okay, so thank what, yeah, so as it's presented is ideally its final form. Okay, thank you. And let me just, I'm sorry to interject. I just want to clarify the three levels of podium. Only one level is, is parking. It's just right. the, the structure, you know, in building terms, the concrete structure at the bottom is the podium. So in this case, it's three stories includes the lobby level, the um, courtyard, things like that. And then the housing is the wood frame on top. Got it. I, I think we're all looking, I'm sure you are too, looking to maximize units, particularly something that close to, to um, fixed transit. Thank you. And I have Thank a follow-up question to talk about the, uh, the term of the loan. We're talking about a uh, 55-year term. Uh, um, is it interest only or is there some amortization? Uh, well, it's, it's a residual receipts loan um, amortizing for 55 years. So, okay. And I'm, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to ask, what does that mean? Uh, that means applied 3% simple every single year for 55 years. And the res Resi residual, residual receipts mean meaning paid only out of available cash flow at the end of the waterfall at, you know, in, the, in the back end of the project. So um, no guaranteed payment. So, okay. And so, it's, it's if I can add, um, so typically on our PSH project is we will have, for instance, annual operating cash flow for the term, life of the term of the project. And then in terms of seniority and subordination of the loans, usually we pay the state and then city, county, et cetera. We work that out at closing, but usually there's that order of payment and we usually try to pay that um, to all of the lenders. There also had been cases where we were able to ask um, the state HTD for waivers in terms of interest and decrease the interest from three to 1% and the city and county would follow suit. So I think it just depends on um, how flexible it is in the city and county that of course the low interest rate, the more favorable for the project's cash flow in terms of operation, because we do need to service our residents and the more money there is to service our residents, the better. And what, I, what, what I'm trying to get to is uh, as far as, it sounds like we would be last in line for any repayment of the loan. So in, in essence, we don't expect this loan to be repaid for many, 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 many years, correct? Um, in our experience on Allied side, we, we pay the city and county and the state every year, starting in year one. Um, CRP can describe uh, separately. Yeah, I mean, we would certainly like to pay back the loan as well. Uh, that is the goal and the hope of the project, but it's not okay. a guaranteed mandatory payment. Got it. Okay. So it's, it's when and if it's possible. I get it. So uh, uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg, you had another comment? Yeah, thank you. And I'm, it'll get, be a good segue. I mean, the way I think about this is that it's fundamentally a grant that might generate some in, you know, some income back to the city, but basically we should think of it as a grant. Yeah, that's and, what I was kind of getting to. Yeah, exactly. And what I'm, what I'm trying to sort out and maybe the city manager, you can help me or um, director you, Scott. So if we waive fees, what that really means is that the applicant pays the fees to our general fund, uh, and then we reimburse the applicant from our affordable housing fund. So the affordable housing fund, from an accounting point of view, would be down 1.4 million, just round numbers, and the general fund would be up. Right? That's that. That's the fee weight fee reimbursement model. Am I right? Or about we just don't collect the fee and we take the money out of the affordable housing fund and put it into the places the that fund. would have, no, it's not general fund. So we have a building enterprise fund that would collect fees. We have various other pockets of money. So but some might be general fund for planning purposes, but building as an enterprise fund. Right. And so then I there's guess, all the impact fees, sorry, that are separate sub funds. So I guess what I'm trying to work out in my mind as I think about this decision is the benefit to the applicant, which is if it's a loan or a grant, then they have substantially more tax credits to work on the project and maybe make it better. 
Uh, but if we do the fee reimbursement, whatever you want to call it, then, then that money will stay somehow in Burlingame. That's one way to think about this trade-off. But that, but the applicant then has less money, less real money to. Well, we're. Yes. If I got that right. Sort of, I guess. Um, I mean, either way, we're we're spending money out of our affordable housing fund. Yes. To uh, reimburse the is... applicant. So if if we loan them the staying... money, then they would pay the various fees, and so we would have that money because they would pay the fees and they'd get the loan. So we'd get we'd get various fees and they'd get a loan, I think, unless I misunderstood Eli. And then I think that's right. And then if we waive the fees, then they wouldn't pay anything and we would take money out of our affordable housing fund and put it into those other areas. So in either case, we're down 1.4 million and change. Either way, so it's a wash from a from where the dollars wind up in the city? Correct. Okay, well then so, I find that much easier. I misunderstood yeah. cash flow, so I find that much easier than to make this decision. Um, so Helen you. can correct me if I got that wrong, but I think that's the way it works. You're correct. Okay, phew, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for that. So, so what I might suggest, I know Council Member Colson has her hand raised, we're really looking for direction tonight about whether everybody is on board with some kind of a financial support for this project. And I think I'm hearing that uh, council members are, and we'll, we'll ask you to, you know, avow that for us. We might want to then work with the housing subcommittee on exactly how that would work, because it's pretty complicated for us all to try to work it out tonight as opposed to doing a bit of a deep dive with the housing subcommittee, which has already had one meeting with um, Eli and team to talk well, about this. Can I just say something about that? I, the reason I was asking the questions I was is, and I think that uh, uh, the vice mayor kind of arrived at the same thing, that as far as the city is concerned, as far as our housing fund is concerned, it's gonna be the same one option or the other. So what I wanted to get to is to say, and I am in favor of moving forward with this, and I would choose whatever option is more favorable for the uh, for the um, developer, and that's kind of where I was headed with this. It's it's not it doesn't really change our our finances right. that much. So, and I think that's that, great. I think so. For our purposes, there were questions raised about the length of the loan and things like that. So that that's where I'm going. If we if you say yes, we want to go forward, then maybe the subcommittee helps just work out those kinds of details. Great. Uh, okay. So Thanks. colleagues, anybody, uh, council member, uh, I'm sorry, council member O'Brien, I think you were first. So, I, just a quick question for clarification. So my understanding, it's it's the same amount with either option, but the difference is, so I think with the loan, isn't there, a, the, isn't it a little more beneficial in relation to the tax credits that are awarded? The loan, they keep more money in the project than right. if they do the fee waiver. Okay. Just one they that. lose Thank out you. on the tax credits. I'm happy to give more color on that if people want to. It's not, please, yeah. Please, I would love to hear a brief explanation. Yeah, so the cost of paying the development impact fees is an eligible cost on which we generate tax credits, and that translates into tax credit equity. So if you remove the costs, of course, it removes, you know, it lowers the cost of the project, but it also removes some of the equity that we would be generating. Right. Yeah, that, that makes the tax credits. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Council Member O'Brien, you're good with that. Very good, Council Member Colson. Okay. Just two quick points of clarification. So, first of all, if there is a loan and payments are made on the loan, those payments would go, um, Director you Scott, those payments would go back into the affordable housing fund, right? They don't come into the general fund. That's correct. Okay, so we even if there were small payments, we would begin to see the um, re-entry um, of uh, of monies into that. Recycling, and, yeah. right? Right. It's a recycling of capital, which is great. Which is, um, you know, we can talk later, Eli, about interest rates and things like that. Um, the other question I have is: so at the end of fifty-five years, um, what's 
we have another project that's got a 55 year term that we we contributed the land and there's um you know we have a, there's a lot of complications around it but there's a essentially a call on it but what happens to your project at the end of 55 years as it relates to this loan you mean no just in general like does it does it become market rate can you develop can you tear it down and make it become market rate housing is it do you guys typically just plan to roll these over? Do you dispose, you build them and dispose of them after five years? What's your- No, I mean, well before 55 years, I would hope that we could, uh, you know, resyndicate the project once it needs repairs and basically redevelop it. Um, You know, the idea being financially, it's kind of like the same as a new construction project, but we just use a lot of the same materials and make the project nicer, um, which will again, just continue to extend that 55 year period. Okay, Um, great money stays in the project, whether it's a loan or a grant or equity, and it just continues on this way. Okay, okay great. And so at yeah. that point in time, if you resyndicated, the loan could essentially be paid off and then you might come back to the city to again, seek support based on the new capital stack. Yeah, or the city could in theory, keep their money in the project and extend the loan, not get repaid and just Got it. recycle the capital within the project. If that okay, sense. great. Great, great. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah, Thank- what you what you suggest is also in theory an option. Yeah. Okay. So so these are future council members way down the road, but hmm. sounds like um, you know, this is this is exactly what I had anticipated. And I appreciate that answers. Thank you so very much. Okay, so yeah. guys, I don't see any hands raised, so maybe time to open it for members of the public. So with that, council uh City clerk, see, I'm getting tired, Megan. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> um, we have no emails and there are no hands up. Very good. So then with that, let's go back and colleagues, if you want to take a few minutes to give your final comments and give staff some direction as to how you feel about it. Uh, that way we can, um, yeah, I see a thumbs up. Uh, so, but ML, um, Council Member Beach, what's your thoughts on on, on the structure, do you care either way? I, I think whatever is best to make more units, uh, make this project um, pencil out better for the project and get these grants from the other sources are great. I trust the develop, the housing subcommittee to work out the details, but I think we should go forward. And I think there seems Perfect. like a lot of support. Great, who mm-hmm. would like to go next? Uh, 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 Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Sorry, let me allow Councilman Colson to go first, if you don't mind, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Colson, are you ready or do you want? Sure, sure. I, I just want to say um, more of this, please. I mean, for all the other people who have, this is such a special project because um, the city didn't have to pull this all together and our staff didn't have to do it. And when I saw it pop up on the HCDC meeting, the other project that's also in the hopper, but was put down on the list and not given money right yet because it's not quite ready is the um, 46% affordable housings at the um, at the at the Mills Peninsula Hospital District. So um, that project is also in the hopper. And it was just you know, I'm I'm so pleased that uh, private developers come in, a private affordable housing developer, and um, you, even though you're SB 35ing it, which I understand why you need to do that, you you guys seem to be putting together a pretty project that looks really nice, and I sincerely appreciate the thoughtfulness of um, coming into our town and trying to build something that you know will work and um, accommodate, and help us read our meet our arena numbers. So so really really appreciate it and fully support this project. Thank you. Uh- Vice Mayor Brownrigg, you ready? Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, So one, I completely support the project. I like, uh, I won't repeat what Councilman Colson and Beach said. Um, Yeah, I do wanna make sure in in a loan, I'm pretty sure I know this, but in a loan that gets resyndicated, Eli, in whatever year in the future, the underlying affordability remains extant, right? It's still deed restricted and set at those AMI levels, right? That's sort of evergreen correct yeah yeah well you know i guess it could in theory change its regulatory agreement in the downwards direction but um most likely not in the upwards direction if that makes sense yeah it's our uh, goal 
And it would, yeah, it would extend the affordability much longer than 55 years, yeah. Right. I just want to be clear. We're not, ref yeah. we're not refinancing and all of a sudden finding that it's market rate and all that. No, right? no our, our firm, um, we our partnership is wonderful because we really focus on the mission of serving the community. So keeping it as low as possible, below 50, 60 percent AMI, as low as 15 to 20 percent. And it's our goal to continue to have that as long as 55 years plus. And we'll, when we look at resyndication, 15 to 20 years, we can look at that, but we really want to maintain the affordability threshold. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and so important, not just to meet RENA numbers, but because it's the right thing to do. And that's the way our city has approached this for years now. Um, I can't help it. I was on planning commission for a number of years. So there's, I, I love the design. There's just two little things. I'm just putting it out there. One, I love that you have the palette. So I'm not a big fan of multicolored palettes, you know, to make a building look interesting. And I think you guys have chosen a really nice palette where the where those colors work. So I want to I want to commend that and hope that that kind of sticks as you go into the very final final. And the last thing is the balconies. So balconies are super cool at creating interest, but those are really flat balconies. And I wonder if that's because you're worried about public space below. And if so, you should talk to our public works people because we've made exceptions to impose on the public space below to make a balcony more functional. And what happens when you have a big flat wall and balconies that actually people can go out to, you have plants and other things that are happening and makes the building more interesting. And a really good example of this is the Peninsula Regent over in San Mateo, where they have one set of the wall has real balconies and one is those sort of fake balconies. So again, this is completely up to you guys, but I know I would be in favor of seeing articulation from those balconies and make it more look more like a living space. So anyway, up to you guys. That's I realize that's completely optional. Thank you. And okay, thanks, just, just, thanks just for bringing this forward. Just a reminder, we're talking about financing here, Mr. Planning Commissioner. I, I know, but it's the only but it's the only time we're gonna see this. Okay. So with that, uh, Council Member O'Brien. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'd be in support of it. And it's, you know, in regards to the arena numbers, this has been an area we've had a, a lot of difficulty trying to um, achieve uh, those numbers. So this is um, a great uh, project in order to do that. Great, thank you. And uh, I, I, I just go back to something the vice mayor said. Uh, yes, we're doing it because we uh, want to meet arena numbers, but at the end of the day, we're doing it because it is the right thing to do. I, I really like that. I, I think that really resonates with me. Uh, there is a true need for uh, affordable housing in town. We, there's just nothing we can say to, to go against that. And I think this brings uh, a level at the, at the bottom level of the AMI, uh, and I think it's really important that we do it. And so I am fully in favor of it. And I think, I don't think we can get more unanimous than that. So thank you, Jen. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and I think you have your direction. Uh, Mr. Gardner, anything else you want from us? No, thank you. We appreciate this direction and we will continue to work uh, with the applicant and with the housing fund subcommittee to uh, come up with the particulars. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Wise and Ms. Uh, Leon, thank you for being here tonight and thank you for bringing this project to town. We uh, appreciate it and we're here to help in any way we can to make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, you all. Council members. Appreciate your time. Really thank you. It. Okay, guys, we are almost done here. So with that, we move on to item number 11, which is council committees, activities, reports, and announcements. So colleagues, anybody have anything fun to share with the rest of the class? Uh, Vice Mayor Brownrigg. Well, I, I won't. Um, the, so one Peninsula Healthcare District had a very good, very good session with our public last week when we were all conflicted, basically doing other things. Uh, sorry for the background noise. Um, I would, uh, anyway, the project's gotten way better and, and it's that's exciting. Um, and if you have a chance to either look at the presentation or maybe they can come before us, Mr. Mayor, and, and give us an update, you know, to the council, but anyway, you know, that's, that's a that's yeah. a great idea. And maybe we put, should suggest that as a future agenda item and we reach out to Cheryl. And anyway, and just so that's one thing to share. And the other thing to share is that in my neighborhood, my district, there's been a real growing concern between the conflict 
of uh, people getting into Mercy High School, um, and especially on Alvarado, but also on the other streets, and really a nightmare. And I want to commend staff for jumping on that um, and commend uh, Chair uh, Traffic and Safety Commission Chair Martos and uh, Commissioner Israelit for mm -hmm. driving the process. We had a really good session last week where various solutions were proposed, um, speed bumps and other things. And so the city's really being um, reactive to a, a real problem in the neighborhood. And it's a good news story. It's it, The process isn't complete yet, but kudos to staff and to the commission for dealing with a thorny problem. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay. Uh, colleagues, anybody else have anything? I don't see any raised hands. So with that, we will move on to future agenda items. So colleagues, here's your opportunity. Maybe the healthcare district should bring us a presentation. How that for how about that for a future agenda item? Okay, I think I like that. Seeing that I'm the one who lives the closest, that's a big one for me. So uh, we have that, and I have a second from the vice mayor. So we're good. Uh, colleagues, anything else before we move along? And we move on to acknowledgement, the agenda packets and meeting minutes for the Planning Commission, Traffic Safety and Plant Parking Commission, Beautification Commission, Parks and Recreation Commission, and the Library Board of Trustees are available online at www.berlingin.org. And with that, uh, colleagues, do we have anybody that we would like to remember uh, in, in adjourning the meeting? I don't see any hands, and uh, I think that's probably a good thing. So. Uh, with that, good night. Thank you all. That was a very good meeting. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <clears throat>